This week on the Green Left News podcast, the war on wages, Julian Assange's final appeal in Britain, and French farmers taking action for a fairer system. This podcast was recorded on stolen land, and Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm going to be bringing you the latest news from across the country and around the world, uh, starting with the coalition announcing that it's going to support the Stage 3 tax cut package despite opposing Labor's changes uh, that meant more tax cuts for middle-income earners and less for the richest. And this came not long after Nationals leader David Little Proud said that Labor's changes amount to class warfare. The truth is that both the coalition and Labor have been waging a war on the working class for a long time. It's been bipartisan policy for decades that wage earners will bear the burden of every economic crisis of the capitalist system. Both parties support the Reserve Bank of Australia policy to force wages to fall while allowing big companies to make super profits. While the Australian Bureau of Statistics claims that wages have started rising over the last two quarters, The Conversations economic editor, Peter Martin, pointed out that wages are still falling far behind the cost of living. And this is because the ABS excludes mortgage interest payments from its data, meaning that the data does not accurately reflect the purchasing power of wages today. The ABS does have a separate, less reported on measurement that does include these mortgage interest changes, and that revealed that the cost of living has has risen from either 5.3% to 9%, depending on your household type. So for full-time working households, uh, followed by households on welfare payments, have suffered the highest and second highest rise in living costs. And so even though working class people have been forced to sacrifice themselves on the altar of the economy for years, capitalist economists will continue to demand for sacrifice. Thousands have continued to march for Palestine in the 17th weekly march for Gaza across the country. The protests are calling for the Labour government to reverse its suspension of funding to the United Nations Relief Agency for Palestinians in the Near East, or UNRWA, and veteran Palestinian solidarity activist Raoul Bassi told Green Left that we need more and more people in the streets supporting Palestine and telling the government it is wrong to support Israel's genocide. The march in Nam or Melbourne was opened with an acknowledgement of country by Uncle Robbie Thorpe, who invited everyone to join the newly set up Camp Sovereignty at King's Domain. And Greens leader Adam Bant told the rally that the implications of the International Court of Justice ruling are clear. The invasion of Gaza must stop. Victorian police arrested one protester for sticking a pro-Palestine sticker in a public place. And then, meanwhile, in Walyallup or Fremantle, Activists successfully disrupted the loading and unloading of cargo from an Israeli-owned Zim container ship on February 3. Blue Mountains for Palestine also held a protest in Katoomba on February 3, where Palestinian activist Khalid Ghanem called for an urgent ceasefire and for funding to the UNRWA to be restored. Uh, On the Gold Coast, or Commonberry, supporters of Palestine have launched an online petition calling on the Gold Coast City Council and Lord Mayor Tom Tate to withdraw its sister city agreement with the Israeli coastal town of Netanya. The agreement was signed in 1987, and Netanya is just 100 kilometres north of Gaza City. The online petition calls for the agreement to be withdrawn until a permanent ceasefire is implemented and Israel abides by international humanitarian law. Spokesperson Jess D told Green Left that more than 27,000 people mostly women and children, have been killed in Gaza since October 7. And she said, we can't let the sister city agreement stand while people are being slaughtered and are at risk of starvation and disease. And you can sign that petition at the link in the podcast description. There have also been community protests continuing in Nam, Melbourne. One of these was the fifth protest outside the office of Labour MP Peter Khalil in Coburg, which took place on February 1. Protesters condemned the Albanese government's decision to suspend funding to UNRWA 
and to express solidarity with teachers and healthcare workers who are being harassed for speaking out against the ongoing genocide. And one of these teachers is Jason Wong, who's facing disciplinary action for speaking at a protest against Israel's war on Gaza in December last year. Wong has also been the target of a smear campaign by the corporate media, which misrepresented his speech as supporting terrorism. Teachers and unionists rallied outside the Department of Education in Nam to support Wong and call for an end to the harassment of all workers expressing their support for Palestine. An open letter written by teachers and school staff for Palestine said the Department of Education is trying to silence the widespread critical discussion and debate in schools and classrooms of Israel's deliberate bombing of schools and hospitals and the killing of thousands of children in Gaza. And that open letter has been signed by hundreds of teachers and unionists. And you can also sign that open letter in support of Jason Wong in the podcast description. Community members demanded the closure of the Heat Treatment Australia facility in Campbellfield in Nam, Melbourne on February 2 for its role in arming Israel. Now, HTA provides crucial heat treatment processing for components of F-35 Joint Strike fighters, which are being used by the IDF in the ongoing genocide in Gaza. Marybeck Socialist Alliance councillor Sue Bolton told the rally that all weapons manufacturing facilities should be shut down or should be made to produce civilian products that working people need, not weapons used for war. There's also a petition for the Hume City Council to close the facility in the podcast description. And right now, as I'm recording, there's a picket going on outside HTA in Nam. So we'll be reporting on that in the next episode. On the topic of uh, arms manufacturers and Australia's weapons industry, Former Prime Minister Scott Morrison has announced that he is stepping through the revolving door between Parliament and the arms industry and taking a senior executive role at DYNE Maritime, which is an Australian-founded US-based venture capital fund that invests in AUKUS technologies. So he's joining former CIA Director Mike Pompeo at the company, and Mike and Pompeo recently told a select committee on the Chinese Communist Party that China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela represent a new axis of evil regimes. So you can see why him and uh, Scott Morrison are going to get along. Uh, while he was still in Parliament, Morrison was also working for the Center for a New American Security, which receives funding from big weapons manufacturers such as Lockheed Martin and Boeing to publish research supporting their interests. And this appointment reflects the latest in the undemocratic trend of individuals moving from public office to private companies and vice versa, highlighting the cosy relationship that politicians and senior bureaucrats have with the ruling class. And there's been some new polling by Essential Research that found support for a democratic economic system and for proportional representation, which would make the electoral system fairer for minor parties and hopefully it would provide a buffer to stop that revolving door from politics to private industry. And the poll revealed significant support for workers and the community owning the majority of businesses. And there was high support among Greens, Labor and Greens and Labor voters, women and young people. But other, de em other demographics also showed significant support for what was fra uh, termed as uh, an economy democracy. The research also found more than a third of voters are in favor of changing to a proportional representation system in the House of Representatives, again with young people, women and Greens voters the most in favor. become harder and harder for working people to go on holidays as the cost of living crisis bites with domestic trips costing almost 20% more than they did in December 2019. However, there are some low cost holiday holiday destinations such as the not for profit cooperative at Jubilee Lake Holiday Park in Dalesford in Victoria. Now Jubilee Lake is one of only 3 holiday co-ops in the country and it's the only one in Victoria. And Jubilee Lake Co-op director Jude McLeod told Green Left about the campaign to save the site from, a de from development. 
She said that a large multinational company had taken over the site in 2008, drastically changing the way the previously family-owned site was run. And McLeod and other long-term visitors launched a campaign in 2010 to put Jubilee Lake back in community hands. And then by mid-2011, the campaign had forced the company to break its lease and the community took over management. McLeod said to help keep housing prices down, councils could look to our cooperative as a model and help communities form more not-for-profit setups like ours. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange faces his final appeal hearing at the British Supreme Court before a possible extradition to face espionage charges over WikiLeaks revelations of US war crime in Iraq and Afghanistan. Assange has been held in solitary confinement in Britain's high security Belmarsh prison for almost five years, and his health has deteriorated significantly, including having suffered a possible minor stroke. Green Senator David Shoebridge said the prospect of Assange being held in indefinite detention in Britain and the US is chilling. And last year's cross-party delegation of Australian MPs to the US Congress reportedly received a positive reception. Speaking at a recent Politics at the Pub forum, journalist Joe Laria from Consortium News said that US President Joe Biden may find that leniency to Assange could win back some credence to the US in the midst of a world that's highly critical of the US's international role. So Assange's public hearing will be held on the 20th to the 21st of February, and we'll continue reporting on the results of that hearing uh, as it happens. Just like Australia, the United States immediately cut funding to UNRWA, or UNRWA, following Israel's accusation that members of the organization were involved in the October 7 Hamas attack. But as we reported last week, UNRWA is the key relief agency for distributing humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip. It has about 13,000 employees who provide education and medical services in Gaza. The accusation should be seen as a counterattack after the ICJ ruled that there's a plausible case of genocide, um, that Israel's committing genocide. The US and Europe provide most of UNRWA's funding, and the United Nations said the humanitarian situation in Gaza, where more than 30,000 people have been killed in four months, will become even more dire. The United States support for Israel's genocide has already earned Biden the nickname Genocide Joe, and within the US, resistance to the government's support for Israel is growing. With Jewish Voice for Peace running a full-page ad in the New York Times and other major newspapers in the form of a public letter addressed to Biden. It said, tomorrow is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, a time to honor the memory of the millions of people murdered through the genocide committed by the Nazi regime, including six million of our Jewish ancestors. It said, we will also remember this is the time in which Israel was committing genocide, aided and abetted by the United States. It continued to say, instead of using your considerable power to prevent and end this genocide, you have directly abetted it with weapons, funds and diplomatic cover. If the words never again have any meaning at all, they must mean never again for anyone. Now we've got a great interview in Green Left. Uh, You can check out online with uh, activists from the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, which goes into the implications of the Israel's war on Gaza and the US support for it on the upcoming elections in the United States between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So definitely check that out online. Now, thousands of Zionist settlers, government officials, and rabbis attended the Conference for the Victory of Israel, Settlements Bring Security meeting, which was held in East Jerusalem on January 28. And that conference called for the building of Jewish-only settlements in Gaza, with Israeli finance minister declaring that, God willing, we will settle and we will be victorious. Israel's Minister of National Security and one of the chief genocide architects, Itamar Ben-Gavir, also attended the conference. Now, Ben-Gavir is himself a settler in the occupied West Bank, one of at least 700,000 Israelis who live in illegal colonial settlements and outposts across the West Bank and East Jerusalem. 
Israeli settlers are often armed and have been responsible for fatal attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank. And the conference unveiled a plan to build 21 settlements in Gaza, including by demolishing existing Palestinian towns. This gives further context for the genocidal war in Gaza, which has displaced at least 1.7 million Palestinians, pushing them south to the south of the Gaza Strip in an explicit act of ethnic cleansing. Israeli settler activist, I put that in quotation marks, uh, Dan- Daniela uh, Vies, put it bluntly when she said, they will move, so don't, we don't give them food, we don't give the Arabs every, anything, they will have to leave. She said, only the people of Israel will settle and will rule the entire Gaza Strip. So this is the thinking behind the slaughter of Palestinian people that's going ahead, uh, obviously with full support of Australia and the United States and many other Western countries. Meanwhile, in the United States occupied Puerto Rico, the government, uh, sorry, the movement for Palestinian liberation has been growing. There's a strong history of solidarity with Palestine on the island, with Puerto Rican independence activist Diane Vieira telling People's Dispatch that, like Palestine, we are also a people in resistance, a nation that exists and that continues and will continue to give birth to fighters who will not give up until the liberation of our nation is achieved. A recent demonstration organized by students on December 18 marched from the Israeli consulate in San Juan to the U.S. federal court. A group called Mothers Against the War has been organizing weekly rallies outside the consulate. And Puerto Rican environmental activist Alberto de Jesus, who's also known as Taito Kayak, was arrested in occupied Palestine in 2007 after he climbed a surveillance tower near the infamous apartheid wall in the West Bank and unfailed the Palestinian flag. Last year, Kayak climbed the flagpole outside the Puerto Rican Capitol building and replaced the US flag with the Palestinian flag. So Vieira told People's Dispatch that both struggles, the Palestinian and the Puerto Rican are linked. We Puerto Ricans are aware that we live in oppressed by a colonial system imposed by the US empire. This was the sound of the streets of Guatemala as new president Bernardo Arevalo took office in the early hours of January 15. The ceremony had been delayed by 17 hours due to fear that another coup attempt was afoot. Last minute political maneuvers by right wing opponents of the new ruling party had tried to undermine the new president. Arevalo and his party Movimiento Semilla have been persecuted by the courts since his victory at the polls in August last year. Thousands of Guatemalans took to the streets to support Arevalo and the Samia party, demanding that the political maneuvering stopped. Indigenous communities from across the Central American nation converged on the capital to support Arevalo, and they had mobilized for weeks in a national strike in October and November as the judiciary tried to delegitimize the Samia party and annul the elections. The latest attempt to undermine the electoral process highlights some of the numerous challenges that Arevalo will face as the leader of Central America's most populous nation, where he has promised to bring sweeping reforms, fight corruption and tackle rising costs of living and violence. The central factors that drive migration to the United States. In a speech, he said, we are facing a historic opportunity to reverse decades of social abandonment and institutional deterioration. And elections also took place in Taiwan on January 13, with Lai ching Te, also known as William Lai, winning the presidential election, taking over from Tasi Ing-wen, who won the presidency in 2016. Now, this is a record third term for the incumbent Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, with Lai defeating candidates from the Chinese Nationalist Party, or KMT, and the Taiwan People's Party, TPP, as well as former new Taipei Mayor 
who you are on. Um, however, the DPP lost its parliamentary majority and will have to rely on the TPP to pass legislation. So the elections took place amidst Taiwanese government allegations that China was attempting to interfere in the elections and influence the result in the KMT's favour. And China allegedly employed online bots, deep fake videos, as well as AI generated voiceovers and threats of economic sanctions to sway voters. But instead, voters preferred to maintain the status quo, where Taiwan maintains its de facto sovereignty while not declaring independence. Nigerian government has nationalized its drinking water, ending its contract with the French Veolia Group, which has been operating for more than 22 years in the country. The decision followed the establishment of a new state-owned water company, which will take over the operation, production and distribution of drinking water in the cities, towns and semi-urban areas. In uh, The access to drinking water and sanita sanitation in Niger is very low. And there are large disparities between urban and rural areas and between regions. So only 56% of the population has access to drinking water. And this decision aims to make drinking water more accessible to the majority of the population and end the privatization of water. Niger is also one of three military governments that announced on January 28 they'd be leaving the Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, Niger, Burkina Faso and Mali said their departure is a sovereign decision to be executed without delay. And the governments have had a strained relationship with ECOWAS, particularly following uh, coups in the last few years, with all three nations being suspended from ECOWAS and with Niger and Mali enduring substantial sanctions. Um, so they formed their own alliance of Sahel states and the Sahel is a region along the Sahara Desert. Um, where French force, military forces have recently withdrawn. Uh, ECOWAS froze Niger's assets on July 30 last year after the military coup and warned the new military government to restore the previous government, which had been overthrown for being seen as too close to French and other Western governments. The coup government has consolidated its position by halting uranium and gold exports to Europe and revoking all military deals with France, as well as blocking French media platforms. Mali and Burkina Faso have also vehemently opposed the threat of retaliatory military intervention against Niger by the Western-backed ECOWAS, saying they would consider it a declaration of war against their respective nations if the threatened military intervention went ahead. Now, France is not just facing problems at its former colonial outposts, but also at home with the Macron government facing a rising farmer revolt. Now, last year, uh, we reported on the biggest workers' movement in decades in France, which mobilized millions in the country to attempt to defend pensions. And now the farmers are taking action. So there's at least 6,000 tractors present at 120 blockades, with at least 16 motorways brought to a standstill on January 30. Regional government headquarters were also covered with manure. And a column of 200 tractors headed for Paris on January 31, intending to blockade the main wholesale food market. And these uh, farmers are receiving huge support from towns as they pass through. There are more than 400,000 farmers in France, which to put it in perspective is four times as many as Britain. Uh, and in the past 40 years, their income has fallen by 40%, with a quarter of farmers living below the poverty line. Combined with antisocial hours and isolation, this has led to two farmers committing suicide every week on average. Now, the farmers campaign has already won compensation for cattle farmers hit by disease, as well as reduced taxes on tractor fuel. But this is not enough and farmers are demanding more. And while far the farmers federations in France are traditionally fairly conservative, which made Macron hesitate to send in the riot police, uh, and some of the demands, the farmers' demands, are not environmentally friendly. Their movement does have the potential to grow into a more generalized revolt against the mega profits of the big supermarkets. 
Now, another interesting story coming out of France is something that the radical left group, La France Insoumise, or LFI, is implementing. And Strasbourg LFI politician Emmanuel Fernandez was elected in the 2022 general election. One of his campaign promises was that he wouldn't wait the full five years of his term to make himself accountable to voters, but would instead submit to the possibility of a recall referendum halfway through his term. Now, the people of Strasbourg are being given the opportunity to judge his performance. And the rules are simple. Strasbourg residents have been given a form asking if they would like a recall referendum to take place. And if more than 10% of residents uh, want, want it to happen, a referendum will be organized within six months. And then it will just take a majority vote for him. If a majority want him to step down, he will go. So it's an interesting experiment in taking democracy seriously and something that the LFI says is a big priority. Now you can read more about all of the stories we've talked about today, as well as detailed analysis, book and music reviews, and more videos and podcasts at greenleft.org.au. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please consider becoming a supporter from $5 a month and donating to our fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. So go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out and your support is greatly appreciated. As always, you can head to our activist calendar at greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find out about upcoming protests, rallies, forums, cultural events and more that are happening in your town or city, including the upcoming Palestine rallies. If you're organizing an event, you can easily submit it to be added to the calendar using the add event feature or emailing events at greenleft.org.au. Thanks to Sean Valenzuela or at Little Archer Beats for the music in this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats on social media or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Green Left Online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.